Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Demystifying Analytical Validation While Onboarding NGS Tests. I am Michelle Ashton of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific. To learn more about our sponsor, please visit www.thermofisher.com. Let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credit tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speakers. Jeffrey Bien, Senior Products Manager at Thermo Fisher Scientific, and Leah Ames, Coordinator of the Molecular Biology Department at Alverno Laboratories. For a complete biography on our speakers, please visit the Biography tab at the top of your screen. Our speakers will now begin their presentations. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you everybody for joining us today. My name is Jeffrey Bien. I'm a project manager at Thermo Fisher Scientific. I'm in our analytical validation consulting services group. And let's go ahead and get started. So this is the agenda of my talk today. We're going to start with a very high level overview of the CAP guidelines as well as other guidelines that are out there for analytical validation. My goal today is not to go in depth about guidelines. There's a very fantastic webinar that was given by CAP on October 17th. I highly suggest that if you haven't had the chance to take a listen, go back, take a listen to it. They really break down on what they require uh, for labs when validating uh, next-gen sequencing oncology assays. We're then going to segue into the instrument pur purchase process what happens when you buy an instrument from Thermo Fisher Scientific, and you know how does that look from instrument purchase all the way through your analytical validation. We'll then go over preparing for analytical validation and what we suggest to customers, steps that you should take really to get yourself ready to you know, undertake all the runs that come with doing it, analytical validation. We'll then review common customer struggles. I don't know if you know, some people out there are in the middle of validating and there's some struggles that you're experiencing, but we'll go over what we found being in the field working with customers and what we, you know, have, have heard from customers, you know, going into uh, creating the service as well. We'll then go over a very high level analytical validation plan example. And we'll finish up uh, by giving you an overview of the analytical validation consulting services that are offered by SN from official scientific. I really like these next two slides in the presentation today. I think that they're great at distilling down essential information and clarifying common misconceptions that people might have. This slide right here shows a comparison of the major operational standards for clinical testing laboratory. Now you might ask yourself, what is an operational standard? Well, essentially it is the quality management system guidance to the industry. And so if we look what we have right here, we have CLIA, CAP, ISO 15189 and CLSI. If you want uh, individual direct requirements, we've um, added the citations below in the gray boxes down there. This next slide gives the technical assay validation guidelines by agency. You can see that we have a new player in here with the New York State Department of Health. But what I like to do when going over this and talking to groups about this is I like to really highlight the commonalities that we see between the different uh, regulatory agencies on where you need to hit, you know, especially for an analytical validation. You can see, you know, if you look at CLIA, CAP, New York State Department of Health, and CLSI, although some have, you know, 
a few more categories than the other ones. They really hit down on, you know, covering your accuracy, your analytical sensitivity, your precision and reproducibility, and your analytical specificity. These ones will get a little bit more of an overview and what we recommend going through a high-level validation plan. But I encourage groups to always get the direct requirements and, and the explanation of what they want to see for each of the categories in these. So what happens after an instrument is purchased from Thermo Fisher Scientific? Well, typically what happens is the customer will either pick their uh, instrument that they want to run or they'll pick their assay. Typically what we see customers do is they're interested in what, running one of our assays. And so they'll come to our technical sales team and they'll say, I'm interested in purchasing the Oncomine Myeloid assay or the Oncomine Focus assay. And the technical sales team will work with them and help build an instrument, an instrument uh, set up around that. You know, if there's any future plans to run one of our more um, high throughput assays, we'll make sure that you have the correct instrumentation in place that will be able to handle that, you know, in, for any future plans that you have than the assay that you want to initially launch with. And so what happens is you'll, you'll purchase your instrument, and of course your instrument will need to be installed so the local field um, the field, local field engineer will come on site. He'll install your instrument. Um, he'll give a brief overview training of how to use the instrument, but then we'll go into more in-depth training. Uh, that's when your local field application scientists will come in and train on the AmpliSeq workflow and give you more in-depth instrument training as well. And then you'll be trained by your local clinical application consultant that will do uh, training itself on, on the assay that you're deciding to run. So whether it be, I know I gave the example of the Oncobine Focus and Oncobine Myeloid assay, but let's say you're going to run with Myeloid, they'll give you an exact training on the Myeloid assay. You'll also receive another training from a field bioinformatics specialist that will go more in depth on how to use the software, you know, whether it be Torn Suite, Iron Reporter, and then if you decide to go with our Oncobine Reporter solution, they'll train you on that as well. After that, of course, you'll need to move into your analytical validation and your clinical validation. And then once you complete that step, you can go to ASLE implementation. If you decide to move forward with Thermo Fisher's AV service, we like to get involved at the beginning, so at instrument purchase. And you'll see in a couple slides, I'll highlight why we like to do that. But we'll be involved with you through the whole process. Preparing for analytical validation. These are questions that we really, you know, tell customers they need to ask themselves before, you know, going into validation, whether or not you're using our Thermo Fisher AV service. You know, question number one, what I think is the most important, how stringent will my analytical validation be? Are you going to validate towards New York State Department of Health standards, or is that something that you're not concerned about? You know, then what kind of plays off that question is how many samples do I want to run for each each study? Do I want to stick with a minimum recommendation or, you know, mainly for my accuracy portion of the study, you know, where I'm running intended sample type, or do I want to supplement that portion of the study with a lot more with a lot more samples that are going to have more variants that I can cover? And then what type of sample should I use? You know, are you going to validate towards just running on, on lung? Or are you going to have a pan cancer assay? Do we want to pull in different mixed tumor types? And then also, you know, depending on your assay, are you doing myeloid? Are you doing solid tumor? You know, do you just run FFP? Or do you need to run also peripheral blood and bone marrow? Because you always need to validate towards the type of sample that you're going to see when you're running operationally. And then are those samples characterized? And do you have an orthogonal data set to go along with that characterization? Now, what needs to be sequenced for each study? You know, what exactly do you need to do for your reproducibility, and your precision, and, and your analytical sensitivity? And then how do you highlight those metrics? And more importantly, how do you sum up those metrics in your validation report? You know, how do you get, make a report that at the end of the day, when the auditor is looking at it, they can see the direct evidence that you fulfilled all your analytical validation requirements? I think another question that is commonly overlooked is do you have an SOB from SOP, my, my apologies, do you have an SOP from library prep to variant calling? And this is really important because I always use this analogy. You, does your SOP not only tell the baker how to bake the cake, 
but does it give the baker the importance of baking the cake, which is something that's really important. I think a lot of people forget in the SOP is that when I'm reading the SOP, I like to see this is the importance of why I'm running my assay, not just here's a stepwise direction on how to do it. These are common customer struggles that we've seen working with customers out in the field. In the first one, project management, we've had customers that have literally told us they have 10% of their time to oversee validation. You know, I, I think it's easy to forget sometimes that you know there's still clinical operation that's having to go on in the background. And I think Leo will pick this up in her presentation, is that there's still clinical duties that need to be done while you're trying to validate. And so a lot of that's project management. And then samples and controls. Do you have samples in house already to run for your validation? You know, do you know what controls you want to include for each study? Data analysis. During the course of an analytical validation, we can be looking upwards depending on multiplexing the assay you're running, but we could be looking up any words of you know, 20 plus runs. In these labs that we work with, they're very new. They're very new to next-gen sequencing. They're very new to next-gen data analysis. And, you know, do they have the capacity to be able to do 20 runs worth of data analysis in, you know, the four to six weeks that we're looking at, you know, getting those runs done? And then documentation. You know, again, as I mentioned, you know, with the SOP in the previous slide, but also with your report, you know, do you have compliance documentation? Do you have the documentation that is going to lay out, you know, your validation report on showing that you covered all the aspects you needed to, and then your SOP. So this is a very high level overview of a validation plan example. We start with analytical accuracy. This is where you're running your well characterized samples, you know, so that could be your Coriolis HapMap samples, your genome in a bottle. What you're really doing is assessing the error rate of your sequencing. And that's because these samples have been sequenced thousands of times and their data is publicly available for you to download um, for you to do that comparison, you know, from your data that you generated. We then segue into doing an analytical sensitivity. That's in assessing your limited detection. Of course, you want to do that for all variant types. And you also would want to do a limited input study. So with limited detection, typically we use cell lines. We dilute them in a background of, you know, normal DNA, RNA to target a little frequency copy number or, or fusion reads, just depending on, excuse me, just depending on, you know, what your assay is designed to detect. You can also use contrived controls as well. I know New York State uh, does not recommend using contrived controls, but if you're not, you know, concerned about doing any analytical validation towards New York State standards, you can use these controls that are available and they're pre-diluted towards target, you know, target allele frequency, copy number, fusion read counts. You then, you know, want to do a limited input study. What that limited input study does is saying, you know, if I take my recommended 10, 20 nanogram total input and I, you know, drop it down to one nanogram total input with hitting a few points in between, am I, am I able to detect the same variant calls at my lower inputs uh, than I detect at my, you know, normal recommended inputs. We then segue into doing accuracy. This is where you're really running the meat of it. You're really running your intended sample type. We also use contrived uh, controls and cell lines, mainly to build up the number of variants. You know, fusion events are very rare in uh, samples that are out there. And so typically what we'll do is we'll take a contri contrived control and we'll run that and uh, they'll build up the number of fusions that we, uh, that we look at that our assay is designed to detect. We then do precision. This is our intra-assay repeatability. You know, if we take a, one sample, we repeat it in triplicate, you know, on the same, same system by the same operator on the same day, are we able to get, you know, the same variant results? We want to make sure we include all variants covered by, that assay, covered by the assay as well. We will then finish up with reproducibility. This is our, you know, inter-assay reproducibility. If I take a handful of samples and I run them, you know, on different systems by different operators, different days, different barcodes, am I able to get the same results, you know, across all those replicates as well? And again, just like precision, we want to make sure that we include all varying types covered by the assay. Analytical validation consulting services for our next-gen sequencing assays. So what is it? 
um, I always like to start on this one by reading this first intro paragraph here. I mean, Area Based Consulting Services, Consulting Services provides technical project management of your lab's AV to help verify that the assay is tested for required, required parameters. We work with you to optimize and develop your validation workflow while providing data analysis support and template documentation as part of your end-to-end -end in instrument and reagent investment. So in a really high-level sense, you know, we are technical project managers. Our goal is to do everything we can without actually physically picking up a pipette in the lab to make going through the AV process as easy um, and streamlined as possible for customers. You can see we support a wide variety of our next-gen sequencing oncology assays, all the way from our Oncomine branded assays to, you know, we, we, we offer AV services for our inherited cancer research panel. And then we also do custom assays as well. And the goal really of this is to help accelerate your launch time and then help reduce costs and add transparency to your end of investment. And then we're all while being under this uh, compliant umbrella. This is a overview of the timeline and what it looks like. Um, if we start at the very left there at the first two weeks and three weeks, these are things that would go on, you know, whether you're under our AV consulting services or not. Um, your first two weeks, you pick out your assay, you get your instrumentation, you have personnel assigned to you. Then if we go into the next three weeks, that's where you're going to get your instrument installed. You're going to get trained by your appropriate personnel. And then that week, that one week after that, those three weeks, is where we really pick up the AV services. This is where we'll go over um, targeted sequencing metrics, what we want to hit during the analytical validation. We'll go over samples and controls, what we're going to do for each study. We'll really make sure that we have an ironed out analytical validation plan. Um, but again, as I always say, we like to stretch that one week out into those first five weeks, just so the more time we have to talk about the process, the, you know, the better it will be for what we see is those six weeks um, after that one week. Those six weeks right there is the lab is going to be pumping through, running, running through the studies and running samples. And we're going to try to max out the sequencer's capability just so we can, you know, crunch down the sequencing. But get it all done you know within a short time frame while that's going while those six weeks are going on we're going to be hopping on weekly calls with the analytical validation project manager we'll be going over data in real time so the lab will be sending us data for us to analyze we'll go over that data in real time on the meetings and then talk about the next few runs for you know the week prior uh, for the week coming up my apologies for the week coming up and then after that, it takes us about one to two weeks to compile the rest of the data and, and, you know, polish it up. And then a week after that to, you know, get a finalized uh, analytical validation report. There's certain things that we cannot do as Thermo Fisher Scientific. We can't help with accreditation. We can't help with clinical reporting. And so, you know, those are areas that is the lab's responsibility after our AV service. So with our Thermo Fisher AV Consulting Service, you know, what do we provide and what do you re receive? Of course, we provide the project management during the course of the analytical validation. We also work closely with our with your local uh, clinical application consultant that will train you on the assay. And it, we like to make sure that you as a lab feel as comfortable as possible going into the analytical val validation. And also while you're running through uh, the analytical validation itself. And that's because we're doing so many runs in such a short period of time. Um, the lab really needs to be at a level to where they are comfortable doing that. We also provide workflow training and optimization. If you're using one of our extraction systems, that can go all the way from extraction, you know, through sequencing. And then at the end of the analytical validation, we'll do a technical review with guidance around sequencing metrics. So we'll go over all the validation runs. We'll go over the data and do a more in-depth technical review. We also have a clinical laboratory located in Sacramento, California, Thermo Fisher uh, Clinical Laboratory Services, I believe it's called. And they do offer confirmatory orthogonal testing if that is something that a lab needs. So what we receive? You know, at the beginning, you'll receive your validation plan. You'll then also receive your uh, SOP templates you know, for running the assay. 
if you're going with one of our solid tumor assay, we are able to provide all samples and controls for those assays. So that would be the oncomine focus assay or the oncomine comprehensive assay. Then during the course of the validation, we're providing, you know, weekly data analysis consultation, uh, really, you know, to helping to take that burden of doing data analysis off the lab. And then at the end, we'll provide a, uh, a, a finalized analytical validation report template. If you do decide to use our clinical laboratory for orthogonal testing, that is something that we'll uh, do data analysis consultation on as well for, for those results. You know, at the end of the day, it's all about time, cost, and compliance. Our goal as AV project managers is to get you through the validation, you know, as quickly and streamlined as possible. All the, all the while, you're not spending so much time on validation, so you're going to come out of it and be able to get reimbursement sooner. And, again, I know I've mentioned it before, but this is we're doing this all under a compliance umbrella, making sure that we're checking off those checkboxes that are required by CLIA, CAP, or, you know, or New York State. So that's what I have for you today. I want to leave you with these references. I definitely recommend with these references, go read the Jennings paper that's out there, review your CAP checklist, take a listen to the webinar that, if you haven't already, that was on October 17th, uh, that CAP gave on you know, direct uh, guidelines for validating the you know, next gen sequence here oncology assay. Take a look at the New York State Department of Health requirements, you know, review the, the uh, CLSI requirements as well. And then, you know, you can take a look at your ISO 15189 um, recommendations uh, you know, for building the quality management system. So thank you all for being with, for being with me today. We're going to segue now into Leah Ames, where she is going to give her presentation on uh, onboarding and next-gen sequencing tests. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, and I'd like to also thank Michelle from LabRoots and Cindy from Thermo Fisho for inviting me to speak today. My name is Leah Ames. I am one of the molecular coordinators at Alverna Laboratories. I work in the molecular biology department, and I was the project lead and laboratory scientist responsible for implementing next generation sequencing at our laboratory. Today, I will be speaking to you about our implementation of next generation sequencing, talking about the challenges that we encountered and the services that Thermo Fisher provided to us with the purchase of their analytical validation package. As Jeff mentioned, you know, every laboratory is going to have some struggles and some challenges when they bring in any type of new testing. Uh, I'm sure to anyone in the clinical laboratory arena, many of these bullet points are going to look very, very familiar. And with uh, NGS, there is certainly no exceptions here. Uh, our first undertaking was where are we going to put it? You know, that's a big concern for anybody in the laboratory. Obviously, with uh, sequencing, you're certainly worried about contamination most uh, in order to ensure you've got good laboratory practices and isolating an area that you know and is designated as clean. Uh, so we had to put some time into where are we going to move current instrumentation and how are we going to place the new instrumentation that was coming in. Uh, in order to do that, we also needed to consider the equipment that was needed. Uh, there's obviously several different choices when it comes to sequencing technology, uh, PCR-based or capture-based. Uh, that's going to certainly make a difference on what we decided to bring in and how it was going to fit into the space that we had. Uh, additionally, personnel needs. What was going to be the hands-on time that we were looking at? Would we consider a manual method? Were we going to do completely an automated method? And in looking at those options, you know, what type of staffing were we going to have to add in order to accomplish the turnaround time that we would provide to our practitioners? Um, obviously, quality control is super important to laboratory to give our patients the best data that they can for um, their diagnosis. Uh, but again, sequencing is a brand new arena, so there was some confusion and uh, certainly some new perspectives that had to be taken uh, when considering quality control because of all of the metrics involved with the bioinformatics process, which I'll talk a little bit um, later on. And obviously, in choosing our technology, we had to understand it. 
uh, what was going to be our best fit in terms of what we could provide you know, for turnaround time and personnel needs. And obviously, every laboratory wants to keep their costs as minimal as possible, but provide the best diagnostic data for our clientele. Uh, and as Jeff mentioned, we certainly cannot forget regulatory requirements. Um, there's a lot of overseeing bodies, CLIA, CAP. We are an ISO 15189 laboratory, so it's important to make sure that we are adhering to all of those criteria. So there was a lot of time spent investigating you know, all of these organizations to see what they had to say with regards to requirements for next generation sequencing testing. Um, even uh, Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute, which I believe Jeff mentioned earlier, um, CLSI has their documentation regarding sequencing, you know, dated starting back in February of 2014. Um, they have nucleic acid sequencing methods. Uh, they have another one coming out that's not even published yet that has to deal with bioinformatics, and I think that's scheduled to be released in 2022. So uh, I'm sure that will add a little bit more regulatory uh, that we'll have to meet when that documentation comes out. Uh, bioinformatics understanding, obviously uh, there's a lot of metrics involved, there's a lot of data and there's a lot of numbers um, that we're looking at in order to determine if the results that we're getting are true and valid and reportable. So we have to make sure that we are understanding this. So some research went into that um, before, during, and after the analytical validation process and it's still ongoing. Uh, availability and sourcing of validation samples. I can't stress this one enough as being a major obstacle for laboratories and not just for sequencing, for any testing. You know, in order to bring in a new test, you have to have valid characterized samples that have been, you know, tested elsewhere and shown to be true and real uh, before you can go in testing on these new instruments that you've just brought in-house. Uh, so sourcing samples certainly was a big struggle and, uh, you know, Thermo Fisher's AV package certainly aided us in this and, um, again, I'll be talking a little bit more in depth about that later. And also, as Jeff mentioned, orthogonal testing. You know, how are we going to confirm things that may look suspicious or may not be meeting those quality indicators that we're looking for um, in terms of, you know, what we performed in the validation. So these are definitely all challenges that we faced and had to put a lot of research into and certainly um, the AV package was able to assist us in you know, researching all of this out. At the time that we were making our choices for uh, instruments and validation packages, uh, Thermo Fisher had two options available to us. Option A included validation samples, it included controls, and included consulting services. Uh, option B only included consulting services only, and both options provided discounted reagent and supply costs during the validation period. We chose to go with option A, and that was because of the newness of the technology and the overall experience, and as I mentioned, knowing ahead of time that samples are very difficult to come by. We felt that this was the best package for us uh, in moving forward with the implementation of next generation sequencing. And as a little bit of foreshadowing, we have purchased a second AV package through Thermo Fisher and right now we are participating in their myeloid assay um, AV package. So obviously I think that hints to the fact that our experiences went well. Um, and we have continued our partnership with them. So in discussing some benefits of the AV consulting services, uh, I certainly would say that I served as the project management lead on this, um, corresponding with Jeff on a weekly basis, making sure that we had all rage and supplies that we needed and making sure that the data from the runs that we did got back to him. Um, the pre-installation checklists were totally beneficial. Uh, I'm type A, super organized, and I love my checklist. It was very refreshing to be wandering into foreign territory, but to have a map to guide us through, you know, step by step what needed to be done. The pre-installed 
checklist um, provided us with a, a list of reagent supplies that we needed, and it also gave us a um, description of general lab equipment that we needed that was not provided as part of the AV package. They also gave us instructions on setting up a cloud through the Thermo Fisher website because we had to be able to transfer data. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the data files would not go through email easily, and that was just because of either the size or the you know weird extension that has to do with the software that's on the instrumentation. So at least this way we were able to transmit information back and forth between our organization and Thermo Fisher uh, very, very easily. The IT checklist was super important. Uh, again, anyone working in clinical laboratory knows that IT infrastructure and HIPAA compliance and risk assessment and antivirus software are really, really important, and they certainly serve as obstacles more in the aspect of time because that's kind of out of the wheelhouse of the laboratory. You know, we have to rely on our IT people to work hand in hand with us. We have to get information from our vendors, um, Thermo Fisher included, to get talking and have conversations about what is the software that we are putting on these computers, what type of information is going to be transferred over the network, is there cloud data that's going to be occurring, is there a potential for the vendor to remote access in in case we have problems. So that is all you know, really crucial in a timeline for a laboratory. And uh, thankfully, the AV package provided um, you know, a lot of the necessary information. Uh, but furthermore, we were given contact uh, names and numbers and emails of people that we could correspond with at Thermo Fisher to help us get the answers that our, T, or excuse me, that our IT people needed in order to approve you know, this information going onto our, uh, our internet. Uh, and of course, last but certainly not least on this slide is the site preparation guide. Uh, this talked about the physical aspects needed for the instrumentation. So we talked about electrical, it talked about environmental requirements, you know, is there going to be, you know, biohazardous waste disposal that needs to go, you know, into a, a receptacle or, you know, is there stuff that goes down the drain and does the instrument, you know, deposit anything that we need to have special setups for. And so this was really uh, important because this was all stuff that we, for the most part, could look over and assess, you know, without having to waste any time of the actual AV process itself that Jeff described earlier. So having this gave us a good uh, head start uh, on the process. In addition to those checklists, we also had a pre-installation site visit by our field service engineer. Uh, we basically set up the laboratory the way we thought it would best work, um, knowing that the instruments that we had decided on purchasing, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, he was able to confirm or direct us as to whether the setup we had worked. You know, he's obviously the person that's working on the instruments. He has to be able to move around them if he's there for service. So we basically showed him this is how we intend to set it up, and he said yay or nay, which was nice because we were able, again, to address these issues long before we even took delivery of the instrumentation. In addition to you know all of the paperwork and checklists and the site visit, uh, we had a dedicated team at our disposal, which was really nice. Uh, we had contact information. We had a good introduction meeting at the get-go. Uh, we had our field service engineer, obviously, who is responsible for coming and doing the install and then addressing any instrument problems. We had our clinical applications consultant that was able to help us when we had questions about something not looking correct. Uh, of course, Jeff served as our AV project manager, um, who was certainly you know, a great contact and uh, loved working with him. Bioinformatics consultant, super important too, because again, you know, even with an extensive laboratory background, this is all relatively new. You're not going to find this information for anybody who's certified in the laboratory. You know, that's just not on our credentialing exams at this point. I, I certainly see it coming forward in the future, but right now um, it's good to have 
uh, senior leadership or someone that you can direct questions to to guide you through this area. And then again, we also have software assistance. Um, as Jeff mentioned, instrument protocols are included as part of the AV package, uh, data analysis, excuse me, consultation, and report reporting templates because the data that we are generating and providing to our clinicians is much more different than anything else that we've ever done before. So we were able to get, you know, sample reports, uh, very generic, just to see, you know, the type of numbers and metrics that would be forwarded to our clinicians. So that was benefit because we could get that started on the side uh, while we're doing the actual validation project. And I think that's something to keep in mind is that everything that I've mentioned, these are all little side projects, you know, that are all going on simultaneously. So it's not like you can have a straight, you know, linear process as in after you complete A, you move on to B and then C and, and so on and so forth. There really are a lot of simultaneous activities that are going on in order to make this work successfully. So looking at um, additional benefits of the consulting services, uh, again, I can't stress enough about the validation samples and the controls that were included because, you know, you can surf the internet and look up, you know, NGS controls and a bunch of different options may come up, but how do you know which is the best one? Well, obviously experience is certainly going to uh, serve to our benefit, you know, anything that's been used and tried before other laboratories and obviously if you're working with AV services, you know, this is what they do. They work with labs every day working with different materials and so it's nice to have that expertise and guide us, you know, to provide the information and helping us to make educated decisions. And of course that goes along with orthogonal testing. Um, what are our options in terms of confirmatory uh, results, you know, when something doesn't look quite right or it's suspicious or completely uh, new to us? You know, we want to be able to say with, you know, 100% confidence to our clinicians, yes, um, what was reported is what was found and true. So we need to have uh, different ways of confirming that. I, I will say that personally, um, it was great to have the guidance of, um, you know, the papers that are out there, the Jennings paper that's listed and the Santani one. Uh, but Jeff, you know, presented these to us. You know, we didn't have to necessarily go digging. You know, these are out there in the literature and you can do a search for them, but to save us the time of going through, he did help us uncover these and say, okay, this is what the standards and guidelines are being published. And I will emphasize that they are guidelines. There are not a lot of strict black and white rules at this point for sequencing. Um, if anybody's following the news, obviously, uh, centers for Medicare and Medicaid are certainly getting involved, you know, with reimbursement and what the requirements are in order to get that reimbursement. Uh, so there's a lot of papers that are flowing out there. And uh, I also liked that the strict analytical validation that we did was not the bare minimum. Now, uh, as he mentioned earlier, New York State has a very, very strict um, black and white setting as to what they require for their NGS validation. The one that we did was probably in the middle, which was nice. So we weren't the bare minimum, but we didn't have to go the full distance in order to meet New York State requirements. And that always makes me feel better as somebody who's bringing in new instrumentation and new validation and you know new resulting for our clinicians. So this was certainly a, better, a benefit for us as an organization and for our patients. We have a precision medicine committee that meets, I believe it's monthly, and this group is composed of uh, our genetic counselor, our oncologist, our ordering physicians, pathologists. Uh, it's basically the voice that is helping us guide our decisions on what testing that we are going to bring in. So it was important to us to uh, really meet the needs of our clientele um, in our selection of a next generation sequencing assay. So we decided to go with a solid tumor panel as our first uh, assay. 
because this was a targeted commercially available panel that had been tried and tested. There are several papers out there, including a white paper, you know, that discussed other experiences with this assay and the success that they had with them. So it made us feel good about choosing this as our first panel. Um, and then each of the genes in the panel has an established literature available. You can do a search um, and any type of uh, publication availability, and you can find information about the utility of each of the genes in terms of patient um, diagnosis and prognosis, and then, of course, you know, clinical availability that's out there. Uh, we were very cautious. Um, our AV services were very strict um, and did a great job at making sure that uh, you know, precision and LOD and uh, interference, you know, everything was really tied up tight, um, making sure that what we were providing in terms of an end product were fantastic. Uh, we had 67 patient samples um, validated for the FFPE, so formalin-fixed paraffin-embedded tissue. Um, we even actually added an addendum to this, and we included um, FFPE uh, cell blocks um, to um, be uh, available for testing because that was another sample type that our clinicians had expressed interest in, you know, for their patients. Um, sensitivity, specificity, our positive and negative predictive values were spot on and strictly assessed as part of the AV, which is good. Um, and then, like I said, we have a compiled list of the utility aspect of this assay um, so that, you know, if a clinician comes to us and asks, you know, what is this particular gene for? What is this going to do for my patient? You know, we can come back and say, you know, here's the research that we did on this, you know, in choosing this, and this is why we feel this is a good fit for what you're requesting. Um, so uh, Thermo Fisher did a great job in making sure that we adhere to, you know, regulatory compliance and then also met our needs in terms of what our uh, clinicians were asking for. And of course, nothing goes as smoothly as we would hope. Um, as with anything, and you know, next-gen sequencing was no exception, we certainly had our complications. Um, as I mentioned, our IT risk assessment process is very cumbersome and very timely and very frustrating because, again, it's out of the responsibility of the laboratory. You know, we can bounce information back and forth between the vendor and our IT, but ultimately, you know, there's nothing that we can do outside of the bench work. Uh, so we did have some run-ins with this. Uh, <laughs> trying to do the training was often difficult because we could have the software in the laboratory, but we weren't allowed to connect it to our internet in the building, so it was uh, difficult to try and do the training using the e data that was on our own instruments. We actually had to do some training with data that was stored in the Thermo Fisher Cloud, which sufficed and you know met our needs, but it certainly would have been easier uh, if we had been able to work on our own data. Uh, we had some equipment delays. And by that, I don't mean the sequencing equipment itself. Uh, as I mentioned, some of the general laboratory needs in the checklist, we had you know, centrifuges that may not, we thought would work, but ended up didn't working for us because of the tube sizes for the sequencing. So we had to make some replacements. Um, and extraction is always an issue. Uh, you know, we are a full service molecular laboratory and we have several different ways to extract things, but um, sequencing was, you know, a new entity, and the methods that we had were not going to suffice in order to get the quality nucleic acid that we needed for sequencing testing. So we had to make some switches on, you know, small equipment and processes in order to have an extraction process that fit the needs of um, the input for next generation sequencing. We also weren't entirely sure if we were going to do all automated or manual testing uh, when it comes to sequencing. Um, our initial thought was, well, if the instrument goes down, we need to have a manual method. So when we told them, Thermo Fisher, that we wanted to train for both, I didn't even really bat an eye. They said, okay, we'll set you up, you know, and they provided the training that was needed and 
gave me an additional list of supplies that are needed for the manual method, and uh, we did. We had training manually, and then we did training on automated, and then that's when we decided that, no, I don't think we need the manual method quite that bad. Uh, the automation worked much better. It fit our needs better. It reduced the personnel time that was needed, um, keeping costs down. And in the end, we ended up having more than one instrument. So we had some redundancy and a nice backup. So if one instrument did go down, we would still have a backup, which pretty much eliminated the need for um, a manual process for sequencing. Um, and you know, and the benefits of the automation is that you are eliminating more human error that occurs for a manual method. So that's you know going to increase our our quality down the line. We did have a bad lot of primers that occurred in the early stages um, of our analytical validation testing, um, and I can't stress enough that I'm very thankful that we had Thermo Fisher, you know, looking over our data and a project manager looking at it and assessing the issues with us because, you know, they're the experts at this point. You know, they are our guidance, and they were able to catch the problem in a very timely manner and knew exactly what the next steps were in order to fix the problem, you know, replacing the lots and what needed to be retested. So that guidance was, you know, certainly appreciated and well-valued uh, because it most likely would have taken us longer to um, diagnose and troubleshoot that problem on our own. So it did set us back, but I don't think it was more than two weeks. So that's, you know, pretty considerable, you know, in comparison to uh, if it had been just on our own. Uh, and then we also, due to, you know, the timing of it, we did this during the summer, which is not always ideal because, you know, there's holidays and vacations, um, mostly for us, but, you know, trying to understand that Thermo Fisher's uh, personnel also has to, is timely, you know, taking time off. Uh, so all of those things did complicate our timeline, but not in such a negative way that it really put us out. Um, the image that I have on the right was the paperwork that we had from Thermo Fisher at the time when we were choosing our analytical validation package. So I don't know if it quite matches up with what Jeff showed earlier, but this is what we had when we were considering. Um, but, uh, you know, it didn't. It was not that far off of what it turned out to be. So overall, we validated uh, our next-gen sequencing, our first panel, in a total of eight months. Now, keep in mind that the AV promise, you know, is closer to 10 to 12 weeks. But that really was the time that Thermo Fisher provided to us from start to finish of the validation samples. You know, we started in March um, renovating space in the laboratory, and then as soon as that was finished, we were working on the pre-installation checklists and the site evaluation, uh, and then we started, uh, the instruments were delivered, I believe, in the beginning of May, and they were installed and had their qualification tests performed by our field service engineer in May. And then training started early in June, uh, but again, we decided to go with the manual method first, which um, some labs may choose not to do that, so that certainly would cut down on the time that you spend with the hands-on training. Uh, and they included lectures, uh, which was nice because not only did you have the hands-on time, but they were also providing, you know, the theory and the understanding, which, you know, that's that's really important to understand what you're doing. You know, not every little instrument is a magical black box that you just put samples in and get results out of. You need to understand what's going on in there to, you know, troubleshoot, but also answer questions um, from our cl clinicians that call in because they want to understand what's going on as well. So we had different lectures on workflow, methodology, instrumentation, software, and bioinformatics, and these lectures took place uh, scattered throughout the training. You know, we started with a couple lectures, and then we would go into the lab and do hands-on wet bench, and then we would have another lecture and then go back to the lab so that there were, you know, it's very applicable um, doing the lecture to hands-on. Um, and then we were able to start our validation samples in August. And we went through August and in September, and like I said, we had the, I want to say a two-week delay with the bad primers, but really, you know, that puts it at 12 weeks overall because I have our 
you know, close out AV meeting, you know, just before Halloween. So it was exciting that we were able to do this in the time that we did because even other instrumentation that's not as complex as next generation sequencing um, has taken longer than eight months. So I mean, that needs to be taken into consideration that, you know, any instrument has its, you know, complications and delays and stuff. So uh, we were overall very happy with this timeline and it was very doable and I am very thankful. So I am glad that this was able to work out for us and I'm very thankful to be working with Durham Fisher on a second validation. So thank you for inviting me to speak today. Thank you, Jeffrey and Leah, for your informative presentations. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Before we start, we have a poll question that will be popping up on your screen now. We appreciate your participation. Okay, let's get started. Our first question is, I'm new to NGS. Does your AV consulting service provide data analysis or bioinformatics consulting? So it does. Um, we, we do part of the AV um, package is that we will assist you um, in your data analysis during the course of your analytical validation. Um, there will be a couple files that we request, as Leah mentioned in her presentation. Uh, we do set up a Thermal Fisher cloud site where the data can be uploaded to. Uh, the files are relatively pretty large, depending on the number of samples that are condensed down into you know, the single zip file. Um, but we'll walk through you at the beginning on how you pull those files that we'll need. Um, and then from there, we're able to access the v, uh, VCF files and um, assist you through your data analysis. For that, we also there's another file that we request from a torrent suite where we uh, do a comprehensive data analysis on how the coverage analysis for your um, for your DNA portion of the assay is working. Great, thank you. Okay, next question: Can you expand upon the benefits that your customers have experienced during the AV consulting process? So um, maybe I'll answer that one, and then Lee. I don't know if you you know want to uh, fill in with a second answer with that. You know, uh, mainly when we've been talking with customers and we've been working with customers, you know, a lot of it is the product management. Um, we literally put together a schedule that will tell you, you know, on you know what chip, what day, what instrument, what barcode to run each sample, you know, just to really take the burden of, of knowing what to do for your AV, you know, off the lab's hands. Also, you know, with one running the solid tumor assays, as Lee mentioned, and providing samples and controls. Um, we do have access to a biorepository where we're able to provide FFP uh, tumor resection sections, as well as um, different, you know, contrived and cell line controls that you'll need for your AV. Um, and the data analysis assistance as well. Um, I, you know, I mentioned in my presentation that we are going through upwards of 20 runs, again, depending on multiplexing, but upwards of 20 runs during a short time frame. So having someone that's, you know, very comfortable um, in doing this data analysis, you know, specifically on our instrumentation is, you know, beneficial because we're able to, you know, easily, you know, get this data, you know, get through analyzing this data and get it compiled um, and then, you know, review it with each lab. So while they're learning the process, while they're, you know, and Lee can probably speak to this better, but while they're learning, still trying to learn the process of running the assay and get comfortable with the everyday, everyday operational flow of their uh, next-gen sequencing assay, we, we in the background, you know, are, are compiling data for them. Yes, thank Leah, you. do you have anything to add? Oh, sorry. 
Yes, as you were saying, Jeff, you know, it was certainly beneficial to have a presence in the background of, you know, somebody who knows what they're doing. You know, any validation is difficult the very first time. You're really wandering into foreign territory and you're not quite sure if you're doing it right and you're trying to meet all the regulatory. Um, so it was great to have, you know, a dedicated team to answer questions for us, you know, to get the workflow, to get the process, to get the daily feel as to what we're supposed to do or what we're supposed to do and, you know, understanding the instruments better. Um, I, again, the checklists were beneficial because there are so many components to this that happen simultaneously, you know, the AV, the regulatory, um, you know, the document writing, uh, you know, having a template provided for an SOP is great, you know, because we can take what we need from that and then fit it into our own process, you know, because each lab is individualized in how they handle, you know, procedures and policies. So we were able to have some guidance and fit that into our needs. Um, so yeah, it was it was really great to have a leader and guidance, you know, to to get us through this this first one. And as I already said, that's the second one. And, and then after that, you know, we'll be on our own. Great, thank you. It looks like we have time for one more question. What's the best way for my company to ensure that we have what we need to complete the AV process? You know, I would say get to know your guidelines. Um, get a hold of the Jennings, the Jennings paper, you know, read through the CAP uh, molecular checklist, read through the CFLI guidelines, and, you know, know what each of these different regulatory agencies require, for, especially for analytical validation. Um, you know, to do that. That is the most important thing that you you, you, know, you could do. And, and then, you know, as we mentioned in the slide where I went over questions, ask yourself those questions and really make sure that in addition, you know, to asking yourself those questions that you have your, you know, your analytical validation planned out. I mean, planning, planning is the most important part. And, you know, in early days of us doing um, analytical validations and, you know, past roles, you know, it's if if you go by the fly by the seat of your pants method, that's typically where you'll see a validation draw draw out you know into a year because you're you know you're you're not planned and you're just picking samples out of okay maybe I'll run these next maybe I'll run these and so you know be very prepared for your validation and then you know look you don't have to go with Thermo Fisher AV services uh, to have a validation conversation with us we always. I, I always tell customers and tell our field teams that, you know, if a company has a few questions about AV, um, I'm happy to have, uh, hop on a phone call and go over uh, any questions that you might have. So, you know, feel free to contact us, reach out, and, um, you know, we can have a conversation about, you know, where your lab's at, you know, where you want to be. And then if it's some, something to where we can assist with AV service, great. Um, if not, if it's a few short questions, I'm always happy to answer. Thank you again, Jeffrey and Leah, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speakers via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. Until next time, goodbye.